Turning points change the course of our lives, whether it's a big decision, overcoming an obstacle or tragedy, or taking a leap of faith. These stories of inspiration and resilience are what Turning Point is all about. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Turning Point. I'm your host Priya Sam and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Tara McLean. Tara is a singer and songwriter known for her hit songs Evidence and If I Fall. She was discovered singing on a BC ferry and she has toured with Dido, Tom Cochran and performed at Lilith Fair. Her solo albums and those with the band Shea have touched legions of fans but she hasn't until now disclosed the details of how the power of song saved her from a difficult childhood. Tara recently released a book called Song of the Sparrow, where she shares her life story, including all of the details on music and her childhood. Thank you so much for coming on Turning Point, Tara. It's such a pleasure to have you. It is amazing to be here. Thank you. And congrats on the book. It is now a national bestseller. That's just incredible. It, it's unbelievable. I never could have dreamed that could happen. And yeah, it's just a wonderful feeling for sure. And your book is filled with so many turning points. Um, I know when I was talking to my producer, we were just having a hard time like figuring out which ones to focus on. Um, so I highly encourage everyone who's listening today to read the book so you can really hear um, and read Tara's full life story. You really take the reader back um, through all of your experiences in such a beautiful and vivid way. Um, and I guess I was wondering, you know, was writing a book about your life something that you had been planning to do for a while? You know, it was something that I thought I could do at some point. Um, I didn't know if I was ready for it, but um, what happened was I wrote an essay uh, and I just posted it online and it went viral. And then a lit agent saw that essay and said, I think you should write a book. So really it was her idea. It was Carolyn Ford's idea <laughs> from Transatlantic. And then we shopped that idea to HarperCollins and they picked it up right away, held my hand through the whole process. And it's just been an, a glorious experience. Wow. I mean, I know you have experience, of course, as a songwriter, but obviously writing a book is completely different. So how did you find that process? Like, how did you find your groove as an author? You know, I just sat down and said, this is my chance to just lay it all out there. <laughs> and I had no idea what my voice would sound like in prose, but I just started writing and it came out. And I guess all those years of songwriting and you know poetry kind of uh, worked in my favor. And, and when I, I have to admit, when I started writing, my chapters were very short and my editor said, I get it. You're a songwriter. You're used to five minute things. So just spread your wings, feel out the space. You have all the space you need. We can cut back later. And that permission just opened up the floodgates for me. And suddenly I was just painting pictures with words and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. I mean, that description, painting pictures with words is, is perfect. I think that's exactly how I would describe the book. And um, it's interesting that you mentioned poetry because there's definitely a poetic element um, to, uh, to a lot of it too. So um, I, I really think it, it was, it was unlike anything I had ever read before. And I really, um, I didn't want to put it down. So um, I hope, um, I hope that's like extra encouragement for everyone listening um, to, to go out and read it. And um, and, you know, you you really share so many parts of your story, such personal details. Um, I know, like, you're, there's so much in there about your childhood. Um, so maybe for people who are listening who who don't know anything about your childhood, maybe you can mm -hmm. just give us a kind of a brief synopsis and, and take us back in, in time a little bit. Sure. Well, I was born on Prince Edward Island in the early 70s, and my parents were, were Wiccan and very nature-based in their religion and uh, very hippie. We lived off-grid. We had a, an outhouse, um, and I was just a little free-range kid roaming the forests. And, um, and then this sort of a evangelical Christian a wave swept across the East um, at that time. And uh, my parents got really caught up in that and sort of became very fundamentalist Christians. And so it was a very different, I mean, talk about a turning point, <laughs> you know, that was one of them. 
And then we moved into the city and suddenly, you know, we were faced with all kinds of different things, um, including, you know, addiction, issues in the family, domestic abuse, sexual assault, um, and just things, you know, a lot of poverty as well. Um, But through it all, music was always there. My father was a singer songwriter and we were always around musicians and artists. And even in the church, you know, music was the thing that I felt so connected to. And I learned that music was the thing that could really bring people together and give people joy and communion. And so even though there was so much, you know, trauma and hardship, um, music just kept me afloat the whole time. And so that I would say that's really the best way I could describe it in a Reader's Digest kind of way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds like music has really been a part of your life um, for as long as you remember. Do you yes. remember when you realized how important it was to you? I think that um, I I really dug for that moment while I was writing and my editor and I came up with it and we put it in the prologue. We thought, you know, this is the moment that I really got it. And it was at a country fair when I was nine and um, there was a band playing and all these people around and my stepfather um, pulled me up on, basically encouraged me to get up on stage and sing. And it was a moment where I realized that I could pour all of my pain and all of my longing and all of my love into a song. And I could then, you know, connect that to the people who were out there. And the experience of, of singing as a little girl to an, to an audience and recognizing that it affected them and moved them and somehow you know, changed the, you know, the energy. And it was just, it was a really powerful moment. And uh, yeah, that's, I think that's the one that changed it all for me. Wow. Yeah. And I, I'm, at nine years old, obviously you were so um, young to be having an experience like that. And it, it's really cool. I mean, I, I think I'm just thinking back on like being a nine-year-old and a lot of people, you know, at that age asking you like, hey, what do you want to do with your life? And, and, and most people being like, I want to be a, a ballerina or a firefighter or whatever. Yeah. And it changes yeah. a thousand times. Um, but I think it's yeah. really cool that from such a young age, you really were drawn to music and it's still what you're doing today. It is. And, and I was drawn to it, but what I wanted to be at nine was normal. That was my, like my Mm. thing. And I thought, well, being a musician won't be normal. So I'm going to kick against it a little. So even though in my heart, it was what I knew I had to do and would always do. Um, I, I I really did resist it for a long time, uh, until finally I just, I just surrendered. (laughs) Tell me more about that feeling about wanting to be normal. Well, I think growing up in Prince Edward Island, it was it was a relatively conservative place in, you know, in Charlottetown. So when we moved to town, we were these crazy hippies, you know, and uh, it was I seemed my life seemed very unusual to my friends. And um, I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to be normal. I think a lot of kids that have alternative lifestyles feel that they just want to fit in. And that's, that's really what I craved was that sense of belonging because I really didn't know where I belonged because I was taken out of my home in the forest with all my animal friends and flower friends and trees <laughs> and then transplanted into this bizarre world where I didn't really fit in. And um and so, yeah, that that craving to feel normal was very, very strong. I don't have it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I can totally relate, though. It's like, um, I mean, in, in a very different way. But I just remember realizing, like, when I first understood that not everyone ate the same food at home. And, it, like, I'm feeling a little like we ate a lot of Indian food growing up. And then, like, having people over and being like, oh, yeah, maybe my, my house smells different than yours or like we have different food. And I think you're right as a kid, especially there is this, you just want to feel like everyone else, right? Like you almost don't want to stand out um, for for any reason at that age. So yeah, I totally get that. How did you kind of uh, adjust to that big move to the city and how did you start to try and fit in? Well, I I don't know. Um, I think what happened was, you know, I went to a couple of different schools and it didn't really work out for me. And then I decided to stop going to school altogether for a little while in grade seven. Um, And then I I went into the school uh, called Stone Park and I don't know what happened, but just the people in that school were so loving and so welcoming and they just kind of surrounded me and uh, 
you know, praised me for my, my poetry and my music. And I had teachers that really nurtured me in that way. And I think teachers are key, you know, um, I, I don't know what I would have done without them. I just, the ones that saw what I was capable of and encouraged me to as a writer and as, you know, as a musician. Yeah, you're right. That that can make all the difference. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of high school, you tell this story um, about a boyfriend named Graham. You describe him oh. in the book as handsome, tall, smart, popular, athletic, mm -hmm. um, played the guitar. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like, you know, the kind of boyfriend that um, a lot of us want in <laughs> high school. Um, so but then you tell the story about the relationship ending and um, you writing your first song one more time. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that moment and, you know, picking up the guitar um, during this time. Well, my mom still to this day would say to me, uh, you haven't lost a man, you've gained a song. And because every time that I have a breakup, I, I just write, I write, I write. Um, but I think, you know, what happened was I was crying my little eyes out in my room and listening to 80s ballads on the radio. And, you know, and at one point I just you know, turned it off. And just, I remember sitting there and just picking up my guitar. And as I played these sounds, it's, I started to feel better. It was like, I was in such an acute state of confusion and pain. And like, he just broke, he ghosted me, which he has since apologized for, by the way. Um, <laughs> That's a good follow up. I like that. Right? We, right? Have, we always appreciate an apology no matter when it comes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was, I didn't even know my little 14 year old heart needed that. Um, but you know, or 13, but I was, um, yeah, I was just playing the guitar and I just remember the feeling of the wood on my body and the, and the resonance of the strings and the sounds. And, and then my own poetry just started coming out and out came a song and that song, I, the, I think the way I describe it in the book is that it siphoned out the pain. I felt better as soon as I wrote it and it became my therapy. Wow. And do you feel like that moment like has kind of carried through to other times in your life? I, I know you kind of alluded to it there that you've, you've turned to music in other moments too. Every time. Every single time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, music and nature. I do a lot of hiking. I spend a lot of time outside by the ocean or in the forest. And between that and then, you know, and songwriting, I'm I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nature yeah. is also a great healer. Mm -hmm. um, in your book, you talk about, I know I mentioned there were several turning points, but really your biggest turning point happens when um, there's a fire at your home. So, so tell us what happened. Well, it's funny because this was shortly after I wrote that song about Graham. It was literally days after that. Um, we we had moved into this little townhouse in Charlottetown. It was kind of a project townhouse. It it wasn't you know what we were used to in the, in the country with like lots of outdoor space. And we had a dog, and our dog um, got out and ran across the street because she was used to having a lot of space, and she was hit by a car and killed. And so the next day. I remember we were myself and my two sub two sisters and my brother were in the house and someone came knocking at the door and I remember thinking oh the dog didn't bark because she was a she was a guard dog she was a Doberman um, and uh, and and then you know my mom went out I don't and I didn't know who she was with and um, that night I we all went to bed I was old enough to look after the other kids they're all younger than me. And I woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't breathe. And uh, yeah, someone had walked into our house and lit our house on fire downstairs and with the four of us sleeping upstairs. Oh my gosh, that mm -hmm. is so terrifying. Yeah. So you um, obviously all were able to get out of the house. Well, it was a, actually an incredibly daring rescue by a police officer who happened to be driving by. He saw a flicker in the window, in the front bay window. And he backed up his car, him and his partner, and they went up to the house and he saw in the window that there was, that the couch was on fire. Um, I guess that's what had been set on fire. And um, he figured someone maybe had fallen asleep smoking or something. Anyway, he went into the house and opened the door. And of course, oxygen comes in at that point. So the fire, there's more fire. He does a search. He comes back out, catches his breath and sees my brother in the window. And my brother is yelling for my mom and he jumps out the window and I guess tells the police that, that his sisters are inside. So the police officer comes in three more times 
And he, t- at one point he takes out, he finds my little sister who was two and he carried her out and she was unconscious and he gave her to a police officer. And then he came back in and he was able to find me and my other sister, Shay, and he carried us out as well. And uh, witnesses say it was just seconds before the house just exploded behind us. So it was a really, really close call and everything changed after that. I mean, that was the turning point. Everything just went up in flames and it was a total restart from there. That was ground zero of my life. Yeah. I mean, just that moment in itself. I mean, and the story of how like this just by chance, this police officer is driving by, sees the fire in the window. I mean, mm-hmm. oh, it's yeah. I- unbelievable. It so, is unbelievable. What, you know, like just what compelled him, like just something inside him recognized that. And I should say his name, Constable David Chevery. He's a, he's a real, real life hero. He got a medal in Ottawa for that rescue and other rescues as well. Mm-hmm. Well, he certainly, yeah, certainly deserved that. I mean, yeah, I think how many people would have driven by and just been like, oh, that looked like a fire. Weird. You know, and like not- Maybe a candle was burning. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like not, but just that he had the the foresight to stop and just double check. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So yes, you aside from this being obviously like a really intense and scary moment, it, it literally did change your life as well in, in more ways than one. So tell us mm-hmm. what happened after. Well, what happened after was was really powerful because my family, you know, we had nothing. We had each other. You know, we all survived. None of us were badly hurt um, physically, but the community came around us and started dropping things off um, at my grandmother's house and clothes for us. And suddenly we were, you know, I always felt a bit like an outcast. And all of a sudden we were just being so cared for and loved by the community. Um, and we were on the news and, you know, it was, and Reader's Digest came and did a story about the rescue. And then, um, but, you know, we weren't really sure where we were going to live or what we were going to do. And so my mom was a single mom at the time. And the and um, I, my, I myself had a stepfather who was the father of my other two siblings. And then the little bridey had a different father. And so they all they came to take us. And so Bridie went to live with him, to her father, Izzy, on Prince Edward Island. And then myself and Shay and David, we went to live with Marty, who was the songwriter who I grew up with. But what I had learned was that Marty wasn't actually my biological father. And so, you know, we all sort of, we were scattered to the wind a little bit. You know, we went over to um, the United Kingdom. My grandmother thought, wouldn't it be great if we did a little train trip through the UK? And uh, while my dad and his partner looked for a place to live in Paris. And I was just so excited. I thought, okay, this is going to make it all better. Um, And I went to the Maclean Castle in Scotland. And at the time I was uh, using my stepfather's last name, uh, which was Martirano. And, uh, and when I went to the Maclean Castle and I saw how, you know, the, the castle had been, you know, torn down and, and attacked and rebuilt. I just felt a real kinship to the stones when I put my hand on the stones of that castle. And Lord McLean found out that we were there and that we were McLean's and he gave us a personal tour. And it was such a beautiful experience. I felt so rooted and at home. And for someone who had just had their home torn from them, that experience just felt so, uh, so good. And I felt like I belonged like that. Talk about that feeling of belonging that I'd been searching so hard for since I'd left the forest as a child. I found it there in Scotland at that castle and it didn't work out that we, um, to live in Europe and, and I ended up long story, have to read the book, but ended up, um, yeah, leaving, um, my dad in social services flew me to British Columbia where I was going to meet my biological father and that was an amazing thing. And so I look back now, and if it wasn't for that fire, I would never have met my dad probably. And my life, you know, my life really blossomed from there. So I look at that turning point, I see the trauma and the horror, but I also see the beauty and the um, the es- essentiality of it for my life to become what it has become. Yeah, I mean, this moment of, you know, you like, obviously, like this part of the book about the fire and and the events that happen after it, um, it's really like 
literally everything burned to the ground. Um, and then, yes. And then out of this comes meeting your biological father. So mm. do you remember, I mean, I mean, obviously you do cause it's in the book, but yeah. what was it like? Um, what was it like actually meeting him for the first time? Oh, it was so special. It was so great. You know, like I think, you know, there was a part of me that was so decimated inside um, just because, you know, life had just taken such a turn and I was, I just really wanted him to like me and to, you know, to recognize me. And as he was on his way to the airport to pick me up, he had an appendicitis attack and ended up in the hospital. I mean, it was, it was like a soap opera. And so when I got to the, to the airport and I'm, I've got one bag of stuff and I'm, you know, I'm so nervous and I see this group of people all waiting for me. And what was so fabulous about that moment is that I'm very short and my siblings are very tall. Like we're talking six foot four, like very tall. And oh, I'm wow. Very, okay. very, very little. So when I get to the airport and I look at this group of people who all look like me and are all very small, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, like there you are. And they just, it was my grandparents and my cousins and my aunts and people who I, you know, never met, but they knew me right away. You know, they knew me by heart. They knew me just because of how I looked and they just wrapped me in their arms and they took me to their home and I slept. And then the next day I woke up and went to the hospital. And when I arrived, the hospital staff knew that I was meeting my father for the first time. And so the doctors and nurses were all lined the halls crying <laughs> as I was walking into that room. And it was just so sweet. I just, I took one look at my dad and he looks just like me, except with a beard. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just a beautiful moment. And uh, I've never looked back and he's one of the closest people to me in the world. Oh, oh my gosh. Even though I like know that I'm getting like choked up just thinking about that. Like what? Oh, what a beautiful moment. Jeez. And thank goodness uh, that everyone else in your family was there to meet you at the airport mm -hmm. as well. Like what are the chances of that, his appendicitis attack happening at that moment? I, I know. I do make a connection in the book about, you know, the idea of a vestigial organ and how sometimes some things have to leave for new things to arrive. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I sort of live by that a little bit. Like sometimes we have to let go of something uh, and just be in that empty space for a little while before it fills up again. And that can be scary, but we just have to, once we learn to be okay with that, it's incredible what life can bring. And I know that for me, that flight to British Columbia was the longest <laughs> flight of my life. And I remember talking to my chaperone, at, you know, and, and telling her my story and her crying. <laughs> and it just, you know, but there I landed in a nest in a soft, beautiful place with a lot of very wonderful people who took good care of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is amazing, especially because I mean, and to, up until this point in your life, there had been a lot of adults in your life um, that you couldn't trust, right? Mm -hmm. I know you talked um, earlier about, you know, sexual abuse as well, um, some, being something you experienced as a young child. So mm -hmm. now here you are in this situation with these people who who really do just want to love you and take care of you. Mm -hmm. Was it hard to trust them um, at the beginning at all? No, no, it was it was just so right I'm very trusting. Um, I kind of live without armor. It's sometimes it's a problem. Um, but I just, I, you know, I just, I just knew, I knew that I was safe. It was an incredible feeling. It was a solidity that I hadn't felt before. And my grandfather and grandmother, my grandfather was a, you know, high school principal. He spoke nine languages, you know, including Latin. He was a, you know, a physics teacher, like brilliant man. Um, my grandmother was a dance teacher. I mean, they were normal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but they were also very magical in their way. And, um, yeah, I just knew that I was home immediately. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very grateful for them. Yeah. Wow. That's, that is really incredible after, after everything you'd been through. And um, it's interesting you use the word normal there because um, it just 
takes me back to, you know, the first part of the interview where you were talking about kind of this is all you wanted, right? As a child mm -hmm. is just to feel, to have this sense of normalcy. Um, and music is also a big part of this phase of your life. Um, your dad actually gifted you a guitar, right? As soon as you arrived? Yes. Isn't that sweet? Yes. Cause I had lost mine. Um, and yeah, he gave me a new one and, uh, I've just more songs started coming out and it's just always been the way that I've, you know, processed and yeah, I'm still playing my guitar, wrote a new song yesterday. It's still, they're still coming out. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about this next phase of, of your life. So once you get mm -hmm. settled, your dad's out of the hospital. Um, what, what is this time like for you? It was beautiful. I, I went to high school. I was in the high school play. Um, I made friends. I graduated with honors. You know, I just really excelled. Uh, and, and I love British Columbia. It's so magnificent. Prince Edward Island, the East Coast and the Atlantic is obviously stunning and so beautiful. And BC just has this whole other side to it that is so majestic. And um, yeah, I, I just, I loved it. I loved my life there. And then, um, you know, I had, I had a boyfriend. I went through another heartbreak. More hijinks ensue. I end up in, you know, getting arrested. <laughs> for protesting. And then I wrote a song there and ended up on a ferry to Salt Spring Island one day with my guitar and two people from a record company were on the boat listening and I got a record deal and a publishing deal. And then my whole life just, I mean, another turning point, uh, you know, just kind of went exploded and I had this incredible career and it, it's just, I'm just so, I'm just so incredibly lucky, honestly. I feel like, you know, some people are like, oh, your life is like a movie, but I feel like your life is like five movies. Like it's not just <laughs> one because it has it's a series. Like, all, yeah, it really, it really is. I can't, mm -hmm. I still like the, being discovered on a ferry like that, like that actually does sound like something that is happened in, doesn't happen in real life. Like it happened in a movie. So yeah, that. <laughs> That is really incredible. So but I guess before that happened, I know, you know, music has always been a part of your life, but was it um, at this point something that you thought like, this is going to be my career or was it still something you were kind of just doing um, like m more as a hobby? Yeah, I honestly, I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, I wanted to go into environmental law um, and especially after getting arrested and having the opportunity to defend myself in court, I felt really empowered by that. And, um, but you know, that record deal, I thought, okay, this is an opportunity. I have to follow it. I'll go to law school after. And, you know, I'm on my seventh solo album and ninth record altogether. And so, yeah, I don't know if law school is still in the cards, but you never know. <laughs> you, you, you never, you never know. You never know. <laughs> Um, when I guess, like, how old were you when you got this record deal? So I would have been, so that would have been 94. Okay. So 20, 20, 20 when, when they discovered me, but really like 21 by the time I like wrote all the songs they wanted in, you know, around 22 when I got actually signed, it was 1995 when I signed the deal. Yeah. Wow. 22. That's so young. I mean, at that age, like, did you know what it meant to have a record deal? I feel like I would have had no idea. I I don't know that I did in a lot of ways. I just knew that I was in really good hands. Um, and I knew that uh, that it was what I wanted to do at that point. And I, I was with Network Records, who were in Vancouver. And that was Sarah McLaughlin's label. And I was such a massive fan of hers. And they had such a, a cool roster of, like, punk and you know like folk and all kinds of different stuff and I and I just felt really like it was just a really cool place to land and then I was with Sony Publishing and they were able to give me enough money to live on you know so here I was actually making a living as as a songwriter it was shocking yeah and incredible this part of your life you know things are really going so well um it's such a contrast to to those early years so mm -hmm. Did you kind of put away all of the things that happened early in your life at this point? Like, did you kind of store them away in a box and you really were living this this different life um, at this time? I wouldn't say I put them away. I think I really used them. Um, 
I, my first single was called Evidence and it was a song about child abuse and the, the video, uh, which was played extensively on much music and in the U S and, and, you know, it was about going down into your subconscious and, you know, and dealing with your childhood trauma. And, you know, I, I felt really proud of that, that I was able to, to tell that story, um, through that, but people didn't really ask me. I don't think at the time, you know, was that autobiographical, you know, I just assumed because I wrote the song that everyone would assume that, but, um, you know, and let her feel the rain, which was one of the first songs that I wrote, which is also on this record is a song about, um, you know, starting to feel again, post sexual assault, um, and, and reclaiming your body. And, uh, and so all of it was all, I was using it all in my songs, um, because, you know, I think with that much stuff happening as a child, I needed, I needed to, it was a very long process of healing, but the music did it, you know, like the fact that I got to get up on stage like night after night and sing these songs and people would come to me and say, I get it. That happened to me. You've healed me. I feel understood. I feel connected. I mean, that was just everything. That was the completion of the art, you know, like song shared, understood and medicine. Yeah, I mean, that deep connection that you created with your fans, especially with people who have similar experiences, mm -hmm. that is a really powerful healing moment. And I mm -hmm. wonder if you're getting some of that same feedback um, about your book as well. Oh, yes, I am getting letters, lots and lots of letters. And it is, it's so beautiful because I didn't know how I would feel once the book came out. My mom, I mean, there's so much about my mother in this book. She was very nervous as well um, because it's all her secrets. And, but since the book's come out, I feel so light. I feel like I've just given my story to be held. And my mom said the same thing. She said, I feel like this book has freed us all from these secrets. And now everything is out in the light. And what's happening is this exchange of stories that's coming to me is I feel like we're all holding our stories together and doing that is somehow that, yeah, there's some, there's some medicinal quality to that. And I feel very privy to some incredibly intimate information from people who've read the book. And I, I just like, I, I want that. I want that. And I, I'm, I'm really grateful for it. And uh, I read every single letter and try to respond as much as I can. And obviously so many people are so grateful for you to for sharing that because I think, you know, those experiences can be really isolating, especially if you don't know anyone else who's experienced the same thing, then mm -hmm. you can feel like really alone. So yeah, I'm sure so many people just feel seen and heard um, in reading your book too. Yeah. There was such a culture of silence around it, especially childhood sexual abuse, because yeah. it's often more often than not someone, you know, someone in the family. Um, uh, or, you know, friend. So it, it's, it's a very difficult situation to blow the whistle on. And so I'm hoping that this book will pattern, uh, you know, people finding their voice and like, they can kind of follow me through the way that I found mine. And, and maybe that could be, um, you know, my hope is that that would be some kind of an example for when people are ready to share their own stories, to just get it out of themselves, because, you know, there's, we hold so much shame uh, around it. And it when you know, when it's time to let it go, the feeling once it's gone is incredible. So that's really in, truly what, what the intention I think of this book was my sort of subconscious intention was to lighten it for myself and to, and, and also to teach my own children, you know, my own girls, I have three girls of my own and it's a wild world. And I want them to know that they, they can speak out and use their voice. That is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and it's interesting you mentioned the timing because I know you said earlier when your song Evidence came out, like people didn't really ask you about like the history or where it came from. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, when you think back to that time, like that would have been the 90s, right? Late night, mid to late 90s, mm -hmm. um, how things have changed. And certainly there is more work to be done, but just the fact now that you can talk about this, you can share this story, there's space for it um, in the media. Like, I think that, um, I think that says a lot. I, I completely agree. And we've been working on this book tour across the country with the sexual assault centers uh, and getting the books in the hands of counselors as well um, to see if any of the survivors, you know, when, when they're ready to, to read it, uh, have it accessible to them. Um, it, it really feels like, like 
I mean, it was the right time for me to, sh- to share it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. There is, there is room. Um, and it's an important thing. It, you know, it, 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 it's so swept under the rug in so many communities and we just, and, and it's, it's across the board and it's all over the world. Right. So we, we really do need to talk about it, but we also have to talk about the stories of, um, you know, resilience and rising and thriving, thriving, not, you know, you know, in spite of, but also because of the things that happened to us, you know, that those things made us stronger and those things, you know, allowed us to become creative, powerful people. So that's, that's also part of the story. It's not a whole bummer. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. You know, I think that's, that's such a good point. And um, I think I'm sure for people who are experiencing it now or have experienced it in the past and haven't talked about it, um, to hear your story, to see what you have done with it. You're right. I mean, aside from that part of just feeling seen and heard and relieved, seeing you thrive and also, Mm -hmm. you know, using some of those painful moments now to help others. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that is incredibly powerful and inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I mean, there's just so many people doing this work, you know, I'm just one. Um, and, uh, you know, the only thing I really know how to do is share. <laughs> That's like my superpower. Right. So I just kind of open up and, and, uh, and out it comes. So yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad that the book, you know, had, had is having an impact like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. We, we have to talk about your music career a little bit more. Cause I need to hear like some of the highlights, like uh, tell me about touring with Dido and Tom Cochran. Like, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'm just going to so let fun. you run with it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is it like name drop and bragging time? Okay. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you know, little girl from the plywood stage in Prince Edward Island, you know, um, I, because of network and because of Sony, um, I had the opportunity to tour with some of the greatest musicians in the world. I mean, Lilith Fair alone was astounding. I was on stage with, you know, Cheryl Crow and Sinead O'Connor and Missy Elliott and Sarah, of course, and you know Tracy Chapman, like all these just incredible, incredible women. And uh, I got to sing with the Indigo Girls, which was a huge highlight for me. Um, I love them so much. And to touring with Dido, it was, that was really special because in that situation, it was, we were the only women on the road because it was, she would, I would open and then she would close and we would each do just a 45 minute set. It was kind of a double bill. And it was at the time when her star was rising, when thank you had just come out. And so her fans in the U S were just bananas and like loved her so much. And I got a chance to see up close what a really grounded, powerful, confident woman can do with celebrity. Like she just, she did not change. She just became more herself. She just blossomed. And that was such a great inspiration. And we were so tight. Um, And she's still one of my dearest friends in the world. And I learned so much from her um, about not just how to be, but just, just how to kick ass, honestly. Um, Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then there was, you know, we toured with Willie Nelson. I was part of a band called Shay with two of my best friends, Kim Stockwood and Davna Doyle. And we, uh, yeah, toured with Willie Nelson. We had a TV show. Um, and then I did a whole bunch of opening spots, which are really fun, like Courtney Love and, you know, The Cure. And I was in Vogue magazine. And it was just like, it, honestly, the whole thing, it's all in the book, but it was so fun. And, and it was also exhausting. Um, and it was the star making machine in full, full throttle. Um, and I definitely burned out after a while, uh, but I had experiences that, I mean, I, I just, I couldn't have dreamed of. And it's the same now with the book. Like I'm all of a sudden I'm ha- like, things are better than I could have ever expected. And yeah, I just, I don't know how I got so lucky. <laughs> Luck, a part of mm-hmm. it, of course, but really yeah. like, I mean, I think that the resilience, the overcoming, the you just being able to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much obviously hard work and, Mm -hmm. um, and determination that, that goes into all of this too. Yeah. And gratitude. Like, Mm -hmm. cause I can now look back, especially after having written the book and I see the leaving of the forest and I'm so grateful, even though it was hard. And I see you know, the assault Mm -hmm. from my grandfather. And I'm so grateful even to him, you know, for 
for that experience and for making me strong. And I see, you know, I see it all now. And, um, and it takes a while to get to that place of forgiveness and gratitude, but, um, that's where the work, I think that's the, the hardest work I've done. And then, and then the music just kind of comes out from that. Yeah. Wow. I wonder as you kind of reflect back on that turning point, you know, this, house explosion, this fire that you're rescued from just in the nick of time, how your life Mm -hmm. changed after that. Um, I guess, you know, we, I know we've talked about some life lessons here, but if there's one thing that you could, you know, pass on to other people or one life lesson that you hope people Mm -hmm. can learn from your story, um, what would you say it would be? Love is all that matters. You know, it really is. Yeah, Yeah. Everything else can fall away, go up in smoke, you know, but if we have love, we're okay. And so, you know, find it and you know, learn what love is and what love isn't and, uh, and really seek it out and follow it and fight for it. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, the love of your biological father and your family, um, mm-hmm. it just really changed everything for you. So yeah, that's a great yeah. life lesson. Um, Tara, tell us what you're up to now. So you obviously just released the book. You've been mm-hmm. across the country promoting it. Um, yeah. yeah tell us more. Well, I mean, I'm just, the book, because it, you know, it was a bestseller out of the gate. Um, the book tour was so much fun and, uh, it was great to see all the people coming out and, you know, making new fans. Um, and so, and now I'm heading over to the UK because the book is available there as well. And I'm doing some literary festivals and some shows and, uh, And then, you know, I have some big dreams around the book. Um, I'd really love to, um, I'd love, I'd love to work on a film. Um, I would love to uh, have a theater show that's sort of about the book, but with the music um, and with symphonies, I'd love to tour with some symphonies. Um, I I need to have a lot of sequins involved in my, in my uh, future. Yes. Um, (laughs) So, you know, I just, I'm just dreaming really big because, uh, you know, dreams come true. So yeah, that's well, what I'm doing. Your story, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your story mm-hmm. is certainly proof um, of that. So that's amazing. Thank you so much for uh, being here today, for sharing your story. Uh, really, just really appreciate you. And I know um, I speak for a lot of other people who have read your book, but it, it really is a life-changing, um, perspective-changing book. So thank you for sharing your story. Thank you so much, Priya. It's beautiful to chat with you. I hope we can do it again. Yes. Yeah, I would love that. We're going to post a link to uh, Tara's book in um, the show notes as well for any of you who are listening or watching um, and want to grab a copy of it. Highly, highly recommend. Um, And Tara, we look forward to following you as you head over to Europe. Um, Thank you. We'll keep track of you on social media. Okay. Sounds great. Take care. You too. Thanks again, Tara. And for all of you at home, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a five-star review. We also love hearing from you. You can find me on social media at Priya Sam. Until next time, take good care of yourselves and of each other.